I hope you're all doing well, and uh, I'd like to begin this lecture on Elizabeth Loftus's groundbreaking research from 1975 by just checking in and making sure that everyone is doing okay with some of the transition to the new online format. If you do have questions, uh, please email me, as, as some of you have already done, and let me know. Um, I'm going to break again this down into three sections for upload purposes, and I'm going to reduce the quality down to about 480p so that it may not look as pretty, but it'll be much, much easier to get onto YouTube and to send you links to. Um, another thing just to keep in mind is that everything throughout this process, any, anything that I add to the Canvas page, any assignments, any um, you know, lectures that are posted will always be preceded by an announcement. So just keep an eye on the announcement page. Uh, for things coming out, and if you have questions, uh, I'll often uh, hopefully answer them uh, bef before you ever have to ask, ask the question through that announcement page, but feel free to contact me. So um, this is part one of three on the Elizabeth Loftus article. Now, of course, in the classroom format, we would do this more as a discussion. Um, there will also be an assignment, uh, you know, four question in class assignment style thing that's going to be uploaded as well, um, and that'll be in the announcement. Um, but go ahead and watch the lecture first, uh, and then you can kind of complete that as you go or, or after you've watched all three parts of the lecture. So let's get started. Um, Elizabeth Loftus is, is one of the more famous uh, psychology researchers from the last few decades, um, primarily for this uh, field of research she developed about eyewitness testimony. So this is the first major article that was published, but she's built a career around this. and She's also one of the most sought after expert um, witnesses in uh, criminal cases and civil cases for testimony. Um, she's brought in as an expert to discuss her research on eyewitness testimony and how it's uh, potentially malleable and and, and not as uh, perfect as we, we think it is. You know, in, in the legal field for many years, eyewitness testimony was regarded as a gold standard. You know, having an eyewitness to a crime or to an event was considered the ultimate um, evidence you could present. And since her research has been disseminated through the popular culture and through the research field, we've come to realize that, of course, that's not entirely the case. Sorry, that big boom you heard was my uh, six-year-old slamming the door as she came in from working in the garden. Um, so as I was saying, uh, the, the standard for eyewitness testimony was somewhat degraded after Elizabeth Loftus's research uh, came out. And as you can imagine, with good reason, it was degraded because she showed through a very thorough and very nuanced series of research articles that eyewitness testimony is susceptible to influence by the nature of the questioning. And, um, you know, that can be in the context of a, a courtroom, that can be in the context of a police interrogation. There's various ways in which person's memory of an event uh, can be heavily influenced by the way the questions are asked and the nature of those questions. So that's really the essence of this. Um, so let's go ahead and jump ahead one slide here. And um, the title of the article, of course, is Leading Questions in the Eyewitness Report. It's from Elizabeth Loftus in 1975, who's a psychology researcher at the University of Washington. And I'm just going to walk you through the abstract. So if you remember our discussion of uh, the structure of a research article, uh, the first thing that you typically see is, the, is the, the cover page, the title page, which hopefully you're following along with the article itself. I'd recommend you either print it out or have it on screen somewhere to look at. Um, but essentially, um, the abstract is a brief 150 word or less summary uh, that, that be, is at the very beginning of the article. So you usually have the title, you have the author or authors, and then you have their university affiliation or their institution affiliation. And then the first thing you really see that's of any content is the abstract. And the abstract is a brief summary of what the article is about. And it's meant as a shorthand to kind of touch on all the major parts of the article, including the introduction, the hypotheses, the method, the results, the discussion, all those aspects of the article. But it's a way that a person can look at a brief summary, a paragraph or so, to explain what's going on in this article and whether or not it's something they need to explore deeper, whether it's relevant. As you can imagine, when you're doing your own literature review, uh, an abstract can be extremely helpful because as you're pulling up multiple articles that fit your database search, you know, it allows you a quick and dirty way to see whether or not I want to include this article in my literature review, or at the very least, whether or not I want to take a closer look at this article. So um, I'm just going to read you the abstract. It's here in front of you. But um, one other thing to note, one other issue that I've realized is I, I thought that I was able to sort of reduce my camera image. And when I, when I, on my end, when I'm recording, it does reduce. But I've since realized that um, it doesn't do so for, for y'all when you're looking at the slides. 
and so there's always this portion at the bottom right corner that, that can potentially be blocked out. That's why I'm going to upload the slides as just a PowerPoint as well to the file section. So you can pull up the actual slides themselves and look at them at, the, at your leisure. Um, but just to give you the brief, quick and dirty summary that the abstract provides. So uh, the Elizabeth Loftus article covers not just one actual experiment. In a sense, it's a summary of four experiments with a total of 490 subjects across the four experiments. And in each of the examples, uh, the subjects are shown a film of a complex, fast moving event. For example, an autom uh, automobile accident is sort of the classic example she often uses or a classroom disruption. And the purpose of the experiments was to investigate how the wordings of the questions asked immediately after an event influence people's responses to the questions, and in some cases considerably later. In the first study, it's almost immediate, it's just a few minutes later, but in the subsequent um, three studies after that, it is one week later. And what they show is that the initial question contains, uh, I'm sorry, they have either true or false presuppositions, and we'll talk about what that means, um, within the questions. So either uh, a question that um, postulates the existence of an object that did exist in the scene or a false presupposition, which is um, it postulates the existence of an object that did not exist. Either way, when these presuppositions are contained in the question themselves, um, it increases the likelihood that the subjects will later report having seen that presupposed object. So as is always gonna be the case with this type of process from home, we're gonna have distractions. That was the printer behind me trying to finish printing um, something I think my wife put in a while ago. Um, we're running her small business and, and my uh, work and my teaching through this one office. So as you can imagine, uh, it's a little complicated. Anyway, um, the results from the study indicate that the question asked has a lot of influence and can actually introduce new information on how people construct their representation, their memory of the event. Okay, so again, following along with the structure of the article, um, we move from the abstract into the introduction. Now, in, in many cases, there's not a heading that says introduction, but the information that, proceed, that comes immediately after the abstract is the introduction. And if you remember from our previous discussions, the introduction includes two, two basic aspects. It, it includes the literature review, so the, the existing research in the field on this area, uh, essentially what has come before this study that informs the theory, that informs the, uh, the ideas behind it, uh, and in fact kind of gives a summary of what's been done that's relevant to this article. And then towards the end of that, you'll see either a formal or informal presentation of the hypotheses uh, for this particular study. Um, so uh, Professor Loftus starts off with um, reviews of the current theories of memory, and, and she basically argues that they often include, um, you know, representations of memory that include learning a list of words, these sort of very, um, they might be very, you know, uh, internally valid, but, but they're not in, really relevant to the way the real world works. They're, they're sort of laboratory based tests that don't have a lot of external validity. They don't really apply to the way things typically go. And more importantly, they're almost always uh, verbal. They're almost always um, in some way language based, a list of words, that sort of thing that you're asking people to memorize. And what she's getting at is that many things that happen that inform our memory are not, you know, uh, written, are not, are not verbal. In fact, uh, you know, one of our, our dominant sense is vision. And so in a real sense, most of our real world memories involve complex, visual and fast moving events that, that inform our memory. So hence eyewitness testimony, the idea these are things we witness with our eyes. Um, and essentially, she, she gets to the idea that under certain conditions, precise recall of these memories is demanded. So the, the example classically is witnessing a crime or an accident. Um, so her argument is that theories of memory should encompass this, this very socially important form of memory, these things that we witness with our eyes that are often visually complex, and they happen very quickly. Um, if any of you have ever had to give eyewitness testimony or if you've ever had an argument with a friend or a loved one or a family member about how something occurred, you know, you'll notice that you often notice different things. Um, and as you can imagine, this is commonly the concern of, of law enforcement, of police investigators, insurance investigators, etc. So essentially, um, she's asking, what do we know about the completeness, the accuracy and the malleability of such memories? I apologize for the few typos there. Those are actually typos in uh, Professor Loftus's original article. Um, so I will uh, fix those in the version that I upload to you. 
So uh, to continue in the introduction, um, Professor Loftus asked the question about observed events. Um, do the questions influence the memory as it develops, especially those questions that occur immediately following the event? And this paper that we're going to review investigates via these four experiments how the wording of those questions has a substantial, infect, a substantial effect or impact on how the answers are given. Um, so through the discussion of those findings, she develops a, a thesis that the questions asked about an event shortly after it uh, may distort the witness's memory of that event. And this is really the crux of, of her finding, which is that the way the questions are asked, especially if they occur immediately after the event, such as an on-the-scene investigation by law enforcement um, is a good example of that, that it can have a substantial influence on the person's formation of that memory, their encoding of that memory, and then any subsequent recall over time. So she engages in a review of the existing literature, um, and she sort of points to both her own previous research and that of other researchers. And she gives some, some really kind of good examples of how the key words in a question um, are shown to influence people's estimates of things. So for example, um, people are shown a film and um, in one condition of these previous experiments, they're asked how, how long was the film versus how short was the film, and that the people in those two groups give statistically significant different answers. Uh, as you can imagine, people that are asked how long was the film tend to give longer estimates, and people that are asked how short was the film give shorter estimates. There's another example in the research of um, estimating the height of a basketball player. So you're shown some footage of a person playing basketball, and you're asked how tall was the player in one condition, and in another, you're asked how short was the player. And there are statistically significant differences in the estimates that people provide. Mm -hmm. People who are asked how tall tend to give taller estimates, and people that are asked how short give shorter estimates, as you can imagine. Um, she also reviews some of her own literature, which is quite common in research articles. You know, if you've done previous research in this area, you'll talk about the body of work that you've done that led up to it. And she talks about how there are things like the suggested range of answers. And I'm going to um, look at the, the article here to give you some specifics. So uh, in one unpublished article that she cites, people were interviewed about headaches and about the headache products that they've taken. Um, and they were told they were participating in market research about these products. And so in one question, they were asked, in terms of the total number of products, how many products have you tried? One, two, three. So they were given some options for how to answer. In a different um, condition, in and in, in a different level of the independent variable, they were asked, in terms of the total products, number of products, how many other products have you tried? One, five, ten. The people that were given this lower one, two, three prompt tended to answer about 3.3 on average. People that were given that one, five, ten prompt tended to answer with an average of 5.2, which is a statistically significant difference. Um, so as you can imagine, the frame of the question then influences the type of answers that people give. And in a sense, this is a hard, this should be a hard and fast memory, right? You know, you should be able to recall, at least with some degree of accuracy, how many different headache relief products you've used. But what the finding is, is that the way the question is asked influences your recall, recall of that issue. Um, another example that she pulls from her own research is about, um, again, witnessing an, an accident. And in this case, she had 100 students view a short film segment which would depicted this multiple car accident. And they fill out this 22 item questionnaire, um, but there are six critical questions. And um, three of these ask about items that appeared in the film, whereas three others ask about things that did not appear in the film. And for half of the subjects, she altered one word, and that is the, the article, you know, so in, in language, you know, we use the term article to refer to a, the, and that sort of thing. And in this case, they asked, did you see a broken headlight in one condition, right? Did you see a broken headlight? In another condition, in a very subtle change, did you see the broken headlight? And as you can imagine, uh, the the leads the people hearing that to assume that their object, the object, the broken headlight does in fact exist. And therefore, they are more likely to report having seen a broken headlight. Um, so the idea is that the even something as subtle as the article and, and the way the question is worded can have an influence on people's responses. And so she concludes that in a variety of situations, the wording of the question about an event can influence how the answer is given and what sort of answer is given. She then gives you a brief, quick explanation of what the current experiments entail. 
Um, so before she gets into any detail, before she really steps from the introduction to the method section of the article, she sort of gives you a, um, a brief summary of what the articles are, what the, the experiments are going to be. And in doing so, she implicitly states her hypotheses. Now, she doesn't um, pose her hypotheses as a proposition that this will happen or we will find such. She rather poses it as a question. But essentially, um, she's asking uh, in these experiments, how does question wording uh, affect the answers to subsequent questions? And so she focuses on how the wording of questions influences the answers, uh, not necessarily, but how um, it affects their answers to those questions subsequently after a little bit of time has passed. And so in a sense, what she's doing is she's giving you a good um, explanation of her construct validity on the nature of eyewitness testimony, because um, again, you know, in the real world, eyewitness testimony might be given immediately after an event, like on the scene to police investigators, but it's also very likely that you're going to be re-interviewed at some point in the near future. Uh, maybe not in the near future, you know, sometimes there's an accident and it might be months uh, before an actual court case happens, for example. And let's say that you're called as an eyewitness in a civil case or in a criminal case to give your testimony about what you observed. Um, that might be some time after the actual events happen. And that's why she's trying to have good construct validity about eyewitness testimony. This is not an experiment where you come in for 30 minutes or an hour and everything occurs within that window. In experiments two through four, there is a period of time that passes, in this case, a week. So um, what's really key to these four experiments is that all the initial questions contain a presupposition. And a presupposition is defined as a condition that must hold in order for the question to be contextually appropriate. She basically argues that that presupposition, that presupposed information in the question, acts as an address, a pointer, or an instruction specifying where the information related to that presupposition may be found. So we're kind of talking in terms of what's called information processing theory. This is one way of looking at how our cognition works, especially as it relates to memory. Um, what she's saying is that the presupposition in the question sort of points you towards where to find that information in your memory. It is a prompt, basically. And she then asked the question, well, what if that presupposition is false? What if the, the question entails a false presupposition, meaning a, a reference or a condition to something that is actually not true based on the actual evidence that was presented to you, in this case, a film that you watched? Um, and does it then enter into the memory resulting in a false report? So that's basically the, the, the structure of these four articles. Um, in the next two parts, we'll go through all the details of the four experiments. So please uh, finish up with this one and move on to part two.